Thanks, Allison. Um, well, welcome to Zoom and welcome to PAFA at home. Uh, we're thrilled to have the community gather this afternoon to talk about one of the many exhibitions that we opened before COVID-19 um, shut us all down. And um, Sarah, Spencer, and I are going to do our our best job, um, it, while this technology is very new to me, um, bringing that project alive while we talk for uh, the next bit of time. I do think that we have some family members here. I think that Sarah <laughs> Spencer's family has joined and, uh, oh, great. <laughs> Welcome, we're glad you're here, Glennis, and we're um, uh, glad that everyone could join us today. And we might have a few, we were, before you all joined us, we realized that we, there might be a FedEx interruption, a baby interruption, and a puppy interruption. So part of being Papa at home is that stuff happens that would never happen in the office. So we're just uh, letting you know that um, we have a wonderful PowerPoint, and of course, we have a gorgeous topic to talk about today. Uh, but we also were laughing that um, there are these other, other things going on in the background. Um, Sarah Spencer is to my right. Sarah, why don't you raise your hand? There you are. You can do it uh, and, virtually and in real life here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah is the assistant to the museum director, that's me. And uh, she is also the wonderful guest curator working with myself and David, Dr. David Brigham on this presentation of Dr. Constance E. Clayton's gift to PAFA. So what Sarah and I thought we would do is what we do in the office, which is um, a back and forth and a give and take and a call and response about the work that we're involved in. We have a PowerPoint presentation uh, that we thought we would talk to, uh, use as our catalyst to, to talking about the show. Um, and we wanna make sure that we leave time for conversation. Um, so we hope to leave about 15 minutes or so for conversation at the end of the talk. Um, we might have Dr. Clayton joining us, and if that's the case, if I see that she pops up on my Brady Bunch screen, as Abby calls it, um, I uh, will probably pause and, and take a minute to uh, introduce her, and perhaps she'll have something that she will want to say to all of us. Um, so with that, Sarah, I think I'm ready if you're ready to get started with the PowerPoint. So do you want to take a minute to do that? Yep, I'm okay. ready when you are. Okay. okay. There we go. You can just let me know if anyone has any problems with seeing this. So uh, we hope that everybody sees the first slide, which is a blue slide with the title of the program and the exhibition. I guess if you don't see it, you could um, raise your hand in the participants section of Zoom. Um, uh, but this is the beginning of the PowerPoint, so I want to make sure that you all have access to it. Um, Dr. Constance E. Clayton is a lifelong educator who's uh, from Philadelphia. And uh, she was from 1982 to 1993, Philadelphia's school superintendent. And that's a photo of myself uh, to the left and Sarah to the right. And we are surrounding Dr. Connie Clayton uh, during the opening of her exhibition, which happened about uh, just unfortunately, just about three weeks before we um, closed due to COVID-19. Uh, the way that Dr. Clayton describes her tenure as the superintendent of the Philadelphia schools is that she says that the 11 years that she was superintendent, she oversaw something like a dozen unions. And it was the first 11 year uh, uh, time period where there wasn't one single um, uh, strike which is somewhat remarkable to think about. Uh, so she had a strong and competent and collegial relationship with her members and the people that she oversaw as superintendent. It's remembered as uh, a very successful time during the Philadelphia school system history. Dr. Clayton um, has also been a lifelong supporter, not only of students and education and teachers, but also of the arts and culture. And um, Sarah, let's show that next slide, if you will. Um, 
here, this is a photo of Dr. Clayton at the top of the screen in um, smoky eyeglasses, holding the hands of her mother, Willie Abel Clayton, um, with whom she built this fine collection that we're gonna spend time talking about this afternoon. Uh, this photograph uh, was from a newspaper article about their uh, collecting, about their uh, being co-business owners, and also their salons. So the two Clayton women, Willie Abel and Constance, built not only a, uh, this important collection of African-American art, but they also held Sunday salons where they invited their community to gather and listen to music, talk about art, and um, have fellowship on a regular basis. The two of them built this collection, uh, um, which is comprised of several hundred works of art, because while PAFA was gifted approximately 70 works of art by 41 artists, a year earlier, Dr. Clayton donated a similar-sized gift to the Schomburg Center in New York City, and um, Dr. Clayton's home in Mount Airy still has a, a wonderful grouping of works of art hanging in all of the rooms of her home. So the collection is substantial and the collection focuses on African-American art, but it is not solely work by African-American artists. It's got a real focus on the um, broad reaching story of American art. Uh, so the two of them had these salons. They also owned an antique store together, and they also frequented galleries, auction houses, artist studios, um, museums. So they were purchasing art from all of the various locales that any uh, serious collector would. They also bought things directly from the artist, and so Sarah and I selected several works uh, that are by Philadelphia artists um, to show that there was a great support of the local art ecology by um, uh, both Willie Abel and Connie. Um, uh, Dr. Clayton, if you go to the next side, slide, Sarah, was, has been very involved in several cultural institutions in Philadelphia, most notably PAFA and also the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Dr. Clayton founded um, the African American support group at the PMA and led that group in several exhibition initiatives, collection initiatives, and programmatic initiatives. And in fact, um, maybe we'll be lucky and she's on the call, but there is currently a, a Dr. Constance E. Clayton Fellow um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, studying African-American art within their collection and exhibitions. So her influence has been large in Philadelphia and focused on the African-American experience. And that echoes PAFA's longstanding commitment and interest to African-American art. So the slide that you're looking at is a photograph of two of the three galleries where um, the exhibition Awakened in You is on view. Now, first, a bit of good news. Um, we have been closed for the last um, six weeks uh, at PAFA, following um, almost everybody else, every other museum's impulse to close in mid-March. As I say, Dr. Clayton's show had opened in late February, so it really was only open to the public for about three weeks. It was getting great reviews. So the good news that I wanna share with you is um, we have decided that when we reopen our galleries in the museum, we're gonna keep this show up through the Christmas holidays. So uh, in the hope that we return to our museum in June or July, uh, we'll still have a good six months to share this exhibition and this gift to Philadelphia um, with our many publics. And so um, I'm thrilled about that. So look for no more news about that as we all get closer to the summer months and hopefully more confident and uh, about the science of returning to public life in one way or another. Um, let's see, wanna make sure that, uh, that before we talk about the specific works, we all have the frame of the gift, including about 70 works of art by 41 artists. And what I don't think I've mentioned yet is that the gift spans the 19th century to the 20th century. So it's a gift that really covers a, 
uh, 200 years of the African American experience. Now, not only is Dr. Clayton committed to the art sector here in Philadelphia and the education sector here in Philadelphia, but she's also built a community supportive uh, that share a support and commitment to African American art. So Sarah and myself, along with our other co-curator, Dr. David R. Brigham, our president and CEO at PAFA, thought it would be really appropriate to involve uh, our community in the interpretive uh, moments of the exhibition. So the three of us invited about a dozen people, um, some of them are on this call actually, to contribute to the wall text. And Sarah and I might touch upon some of the um, uh, ways in which the, our, our community collaborators uh, read the work and experienced the work because uh, for, to my, our mind that just meant that there were more voices interpreting these really powerful pieces and we liked the spirit we felt it was in the spirit of Dr. Clayton. So that's been a, a kind of large part of our um, prepping for this exhibition. So how we've ex organized the PowerPoint we have an installation shot, and then we're gonna zero in on some of the artworks uh, in the installation shot. While I have given gallery tours for about three decades, I have never done it online. So mm -hmm. we, we're gonna, this is a bit of an experiment for, for me, of course, Sarah's much younger than me, so she's probably done this uh, many, many times. But we're gonna, so Sarah, if you take the next slide, I think, yeah. So hopefully you all, um, and by the way, you can collapse the, um, the Brady Bunch grid uh, at the top of it by just um, uh, hitting one of the, the smallest line at the top left section of the photographs of the entire uh, audience in this talk. And that way you'll get a full, beautiful image of our installation. So the way we're gonna take you through the three galleries of Dr. Clayton's gift, um, is we're going to show you an install, install shot like you're seeing now and then we're going to narrow in and talk about a few of the objects. We aren't going to talk about all 70 artworks and we aren't going to talk about all 41 artists, but we are going to tease out about 10, 10 uh, artists and their work in this talk uh, this afternoon. So Sarah, that might be a nice turning over to you if you want to show the next slide and talk about one of our favorite pieces. Yeah, so um, one of the pieces that's really become a highlight for the exhibition is this beautiful portrait done by Laura Wheeler Waring called The Study of a Student. So um, Laura Wheeler Waring is one of the artists in the collection who we've kind of found the most parallels with Dr. Clayton. Um, they're both, you know, dedicated to the city of Philadelphia, spending long-term careers teaching here, but also um, deeply devoted, I think, to youth and also promoting arts education. Uh, Laura Wheeler Waring in particular, she studied at PAFA as a student until she graduated there in 1914. Um, she's mostly known, of course, for her portrait works. You guys might have seen um, her portrait of Marian Anderson, another prominent Philadelphian uh, that's actually at the Nat National Portrait Gallery. While she was at PAFA, she excelled as a student. She was the first African-American woman to be awarded the Crescent oh. Traveling Scholarship. It's one of PAFA's highest awards given, and it actually gave her the opportunity to travel to Paris and to study. Um, and while she was in Paris, one of the things that I think is so special about her time there is that she spent time connecting with one of her idols, another artist in this collection, which is Henry Oswa Tanner. Um, and it's something that we've drawn upon while uh, kind of going through how to interpret Dr. Clayton's collection. It's not just this incredible span and, and depth of African American art history, it's also a history of Black artistic networks and networking that happens from from and through mentorship. And I think this, this wall in particular, uh, with Laura Wheeler wearing Henry Tanner, and then also a banister, which we'll get to next, sort of represents the, this early connection between early 19th century African American artists into this new age of 20th century African American artists as well. 
Um, some other things that I like to point out about her, of course, is that she was not only an artist, she also became a teacher. She taught at a historically black college, Cheney University, which is still in existence now. She taught there for 30 years, and she was instrumental in developing both the art and music departments there. Um, she also married another Philadelphian who taught in Philadelphia public schools. It was pretty special. We had a member of our community, Dr. Height, who is the current superintendent of public schools, actually write a wonderful text panel about this piece, relating it uh, as well to Dr. Clayton's commitment and her legacy on Philadelphia's community. So the next piece, as I mentioned, uh, is this Edward Bannister landscape. I think he's one of the older artists that we have in the collection, along with Henry Oswald Tanner. Um, it's important to me that this piece is highlighted because he, he is one of, if not the uh, major African-American tonalist uh, painter of the late 19th century. And I think this piece is just another example of the depth of Dr. Clayton's collection, but also it's sort of chronicling that history of African-American artistry and how it's developed over time. One of the things that I think is so interesting about Bannister as an artist and sort of in the sequence that the collection displays is that he was an advocate for freedom and equality, yet that's a topic that's not touched upon in his painting. And I think for conversations, uh, in, in, for conversations in regards to what we see African-American artists portraying over time, this is important to think about, about whether or not, um, or why he decided to really focus on landscape uh, paintings and how that decision over time sort of develops into something else for African-American artists who really focus on these Afrocentric subjects and uh, contexts. So I'm going to move over to the next wall. So Brooke, do you want to kind of take over from here? Uh, for a little bit, sure. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, a little bit back here. That's good. Um, so this is the same gallery. We're looking uh, opposite the wall that we just talked about with Laura Wheeler wearing Bannister and then some tanners that yeah, I don't know that you saw very well. Oh, I can't wait until we can all get back into the museum and see these works uh, in the flesh. So um, I think, Sarah, it's safe to say that this was one of our favorite walls, the wall that's kind of in the center of the slide. I do, do you I agree? do, I like this wall. And you had some beautiful things to say about the wall. So before we get into the specifics of the, the works that are surrounding the large canvas uh, with a sort of a bleached wood frame, a beech wood frame around it, featuring four young children, you wanna say a little bit about what that grouping means to you because you, oh, that's perfect. Uh, because you um, uh, really had a voice yeah, in creating um, that grouping. So this piece is also by Laura Wheeler Waring. Um, I really connected with it because of the really intimate and sensitive uh, nature of the painting. I think it relates really well to a private collector's home. Um, in addition to this beautiful reflection of black youth, I think the entire wall sort of covers that. It really goes into, I think, um, not only wearing skill as a portraitist, but how powerful I think portraits can be in conveying certain underlying messages. I think in particular, what Waring sees when she looks at a group of black children. Um, so one of the things that we'll see in a detail later on is the really, the depth of emotion that each of the figures has. One of the figures is, you know, very contemplative, but more importantly, there's just this pure expression of joy on a figure that's uh, centered here in the middle. And I think that's extremely important in how, um, we talk about, I think, Black identity, particularly with children, because from your earliest point in life, I think you have an understanding of uh, not only your value, but also how the world sees you. And I think this painting in particular reflects that, reflects what a lot of Black artists were trying to do to create a positive and nurturing image uh, surrounding Black youth as the next generation. Yeah, so let's look at some of those nurturing images with, in detail. So I guess let's move to Charles White. So hopefully you're all looking at a detail uh, or an artwork 
um, uh, from the wall that we were just looking at. And, and it actually, this, on my screen at least, uh, it's actually almost um, life size. Mm -hmm. It's about, this is a small Ekshang, um, about four inches high by five and a half inches wide. So if you're on a laptop like me, perhaps you're looking at it similarly sized. It's kind of neat to know that this is close to actual size since we're working remotely and digitally. And to give you a little bit of the behind the scenes, um, when we started having discussions with Dr. Clayton, uh, we were invited into her home here in Philadelphia. Um, uh, David and I went originally, we went back a, a, a several times actually, and really um, had an opportunity to consider the scope of the collection in her home. So we were looking throughout the rooms of, of her home in a domestic setting and really uh, finding one, uh, one exciting artwork after another. And what was so rewarding about this work is that it wasn't hanging on the wall. It was actually like a lot of collectors. Um, uh, there was, you know, uh, there were many different piles of artwork leaning against one another against a wall because that's typical of collectors. Um, and we were pretty excited to see this framed etching um, uh, on our second visit to Dr. Clayton's collection in her home. Uh, and also, it's not a museum gallery, it's a home. So the lighting was domestic too and a little dim. And so it was a little hard to read sometimes the signatures. So when we were really able to look closely at this etching, um, I just was jumping out of my skin. I was so excited to think that um, a Charles White would be in this gift. And as we started looking thoroughly at the collection, uh, we ended up uh, asking for uh, three Charles White's works from Dr. Clayton, all of which she gave to PAFA, our first Charles White's in our permanent collection, um, and all of them in this exhibition. This is the only one we're going to look at today. Uh, but I'm so thrilled by this etching uh, being a part of PAFA's collection because Charles White is a very important American artist, an artist who is from Chicago. He had a very young and early interest in art making and because the Art Institute of Chicago had programs for youth, just like Papa does, um, a White uh, uh, took advantage of those classes and um, was surrounding himself with artists and art making even before he was a teenager. It's a very young boy. Um, and the Art Institute of Chicago continued to play a role in White's life because he ended up going to college there as well in art school. Um, we're talking a lot now in this COVID-19 era about how we're going to support artists in the coming years. And something that keeps coming up quite frequently in the press that I'm reading and the opinions that I'm reading is that we need another WPA uh, era. We need an era where the government supports government projects and in, employs artists. Well, a lot of the artists Sarah and I are gonna talk about today happen to be beneficiaries of the WPA um, in the early 20th century. And Charles White was one of those. It was one of his early jobs as a young man he had a, a life that took him into many cities. Um, he lived in New Orleans and worked at Dillard University. He went to Mex Mexico City for a spell. In this period of time, he was actually married to Elizabeth Catlett, um, an artist we're gonna talk about at the end of the presentation. But he eventually landed in Los Angeles and stayed. And in Los Angeles, he was there for about 15 years before he died in 1979. Um, and while in LA, he taught at the Otis College of Art, a peer institution of PAFA actually. And um, something that's exciting to think about now is that White was the teacher of um, artists we've all been talking about for a long time, such as David Hammonds, Carrie James Marshall, and if you're a West Coast person, um, Alonzo Davis will be a very familiar name to you. Not only, uh, Charles White came to mind recently too for me because um, about two weeks ago, many of us, um, we're mourning the loss of Dr. David Driscoll, an important art historian. 
and um, one of Driscoll's most formative projects, two centuries of black American art uh, included Charles White. Uh, so there's um, a lot of connections to make to PAFA and Charles White, and we're thrilled that this gift allows us to include him in our story about American art. Sarah, let's go to the next image. <laughs> yeah. So just this is a detail of the image that I previously was talking about in the um, exhibition layout there. Um, so as you guys can see, what I was mentioning was this figure here in the center. Um, and I think just the joy on this boy's face is so sweet and so enduring. I also like this painting just because of her reputation as a portraitist and the type of people that she actually gained a lot of fame for depicting. Um, I think this image in particular just equates these children with the, at the same level as those individuals. So I'm gonna go to another image here. Um, this piece by Louise Malou Jones. It's one of my favorites actually in the collection for a number of reasons. I just think that aesthetically it is a very gorgeous painting. The cool tones that she uses, I think, uh, complement the figure's skin and those tones that are brought out by the different dapples of light that you guys can see here as well. I think that as I mentioned, portraiture is a way to kind of combat against stereotypes specifically for African American artists and subjects. Um, I think that it allows for figures to really uh, reflect individuals as being nuanced and complex and much more than what we see at face value. And um, I think that's something that Dr. Clayton, as an educator, definitely picks up on um, because one of the things that I enjoyed the most at the opening was seeing how many of her former students were so deeply influenced by not only her compassion, but her ability to really individualize uh, each interaction with the student. And that lasted until late adulthood that they're still supporting um, Dr. Clayton, but also still finding a way to support something that she was deeply passionate about, which was the arts. Yeah, and you know, Jones was also much like Charles White and the artist um, on the right of this slide, Barclay L. Hendricks, a teacher, not only a practicing artist for um, much of her career, but also a faculty member at Howard for, I think, almost 50 years, Howard University mm -hmm. in DC. And similarly, Barclay Hendricks, um, an artist familiar to um, our PAFA family, because he's a PAFA alum and a Philadelphia native, um, had a long, decades-long teaching career at Connecticut College in New London. Um, uh, Barclay is someone who has had a skyrocketing career towards the end of his life for the last 15, 20 years of his life, um, getting sort of mainstream art world accolades uh, um, from every corner of the art world. And um, this, so when we saw this charcoal and pastel in Dr. Clayton's home, Again, we really jumped out of our skin and just got deeply excited. We, we saw the signature, which I think you can see on this slide. Um, it's just on the collar of the boy's shirt. Um, and it's uh, signed Barclay Hendricks. It's not dated, but we have conferred with his widow, um, Susan Hendricks in New, New London. Um, and she dates this to circa late 1960s. And she even thinks that this sensitive charcoal rendering uh, might be Barclay's younger brother and the timing uh, would be right. And so stay tuned as we have the opportunity in the future to research this gift more thoroughly. Um, we're hoping to identify this sitter um, and this both assertive and sensitive portrait of a young, young child. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, uh, and um, we had this wall of youth and we decided to kind of bookend it with portraits of family. So, of course, this, um, this uh, print by William H. Johnson just seemed like a fitting bookend for uh, our wall of families and wall of young children. And William Johnson um, is uh, someone who was born in South Carolina 
uh, uh, much like Charles White, moved around quite a bit during his 70 years, uh, moved up to North uh, New York City when he was 17 and studied at the National Academy of Design, a peer institution to PAFA. Um, uh, hightailed it to France and Sweden, coming back to Harlem, being employed by the WPA, as I mentioned earlier, just as Charles White was, I think pointing to the importance of supporting artists during economic downturns. And again, bringing up this uh, uh, contemporary idea and impulse to reignite a WPA-like program um, in the 21st century post-COVID-19. Um, uh, Johnson is often talked about uh, for his folk-ish, naive-like uh, style in both his prints and his marvelous paintings. And he is quoted uh, when describing and asked about that style, which perhaps at the time um, felt a little bit like an outlier to the styles of the art world of his time, that his goal was really to quote unquote, paint his own people. And in painting his own people, that so-called folk and naive style really allowed him to depict the African-American experience in a bold, declarative, and colorful way through these um, large forms and this uniform palette. Uh, and this, uh, once you become familiar with a few Johnsons, and we have more than a dozen William Johnsons in our permanent collection, uh, it's hard not to um, recognize him when you're visiting other museums and galleries. Um, Sarah, I think we can keep moving along. I'm mindful of our time. And what you don't realize about Sarah and me is that we could talk all afternoon about this collection. So <laughs> um, we, uh, we also kind of devoted a portion of the exhibition to a section on labor. Uh, a lot of the works that Dr. Clayton gifted to PAFA included images of people working men, women, and children, all in different poses and postures and occupations. This is probably one of my favorite paintings in the show. It's kind of hard to believe that it's a, a modestly sized, maybe, maybe perhaps an oil sketch. It's 17 by 14. It just um, excites me every time I see it. Uh, it's dated from the 40s and it's by Claude Clark, uh, want to point out uh, to, to try and enliven this collection, which is historical, and enliven it to um, our current times, another WPA artist, Claude Clark, also employed by our federal government to produce federal art projects. And there's no question that the WPA allowed artists to be artists. Um, since we're a PAFA, a PAFA community this afternoon, I hope you'll love to learn that Claude Clark, um, while he was born in Georgia, um, uh, studied here in Philadelphia. He went to, um, well, what's now the University of the Arts, but was at the time the Philadelphia Museum of, of the Arts School. Um, he also studied at Barnes, at the Barnes Foundation. And one of his favorite artists uh, was Vincent van Gogh. And uh, we're showing a, detail, a few details of this painting because he loved working with a palette knife. He loved, you know, clumping the paint onto his surfaces and really moving it around so that it animated his subjects and brought them uh, to an incredible, lively sense of movement and, um, and uh, energy. Um, obviously, pushing uh, the brush end or, the, or, or a stylus of some kind into the wet paint to give a drawn line, which you can see on the forearm of one of the workers. Um, he, uh, he's just an exciting painter. This is one of my favorite sections, just showing um, the torso of one of the workers and the detail of how he um, really luxuriated in applying paint to the surface. Uh, painting feels like it should be five feet tall and it's uh, not even two feet tall. So um, we're thrilled that this has entered the collection and um, uh, uh, this is our first Claude Clark for, for Papa's collection. So that's also exciting to us. Let's continue on, Sarah. Yay, okay. <laughs> not going to lie, this is my favorite section. 
I love the sculptures. So with the collection, we got three really beautiful sculptures that uh, kind of show this generational, generational continuity um, that's quite beautiful. So one of the sculptures pictured here is by Nay Howard Jackson. It's titled Slave Boy. And then to the right of that sculpture is Augusta Savage's Gammon, pictured here. And then a piece by Richmond Barté. Uh, I wish I had a, a better image of that, but that piece is called Head of a Dancer. Um, and these three sculptures, the grouping in particular, uh, it's done purposefully. You start from one generation to the next and then to the following. And I think the piece here by Augusta Savage, which is particularly exciting to have in Papa's permanent collection, sort of brings it all together. Um, Augusta Savage as a sculptress was incredible. I think for her time period, she really is one of the most influential artists, at least in my opinion, for the next generation. Um, where we put the sculpture, it's sort of looking towards the future, towards one of her um, protégés, uh, Jacob Lawrence. And I think one of the things that stands out about this collection in particular is the legacy that it leaves not only for Dr. Clayton, but the legacy that exists um, because of these artists, uh, a legacy that continues to happen. And I think that PAFA is a perfect space to have that type of conversation, but also to have a permanent collection that reflects that continued space of learning, um, the space where the next generation will reflect, but also find inspiration, which I think is so important. Um, I think also with this grouping of sculptures, you can see uh, the way in which Black artists start to change their own, um, I think, perspectives and their own way of conveying uh, identity in more forms. And I think that PAFA is sort of the, the perfect place to discuss um, this broad and very rich and diverse story uh, of our history, uh, particularly the stories of African-American artists um, like Augusta Savage. Uh, one thing that I think too that stands out about Gammon is the way in which Savage captures this really, I don't know, emotive quality in her sculpture. Many people say that Gammon appears to be wise beyond his years, and I can agree with that. I think um, this piece in conversation with, with the two here sort of helps to bring bring that to light, bring bring to light how uh, I think Black artistry ha has had to take leaps and bounds to continue to be uh, of prominence in a way. And um, if Brittany, uh, Dr. Brittany Webb, if you stay around and hang around for the Q&A section, maybe there's something you'd want to add about Gammon since you wrote such a beautiful label for the exhibition. So not putting you on the spot, just if you felt like adding to what's been said, um, I'm sure everyone would love to hear it. So let's move to the next slide, Sarah. And Sarah, I think we have just a, maybe five more minutes to get through the, the, the rest of our PowerPoint. So, I'm going to kind of be a little, try and be brief, but as you can all tell, it's really hard for us to be brief because we love these works um, so much. Um, uh, well, what we've been talking about a lot of historical artists, and we've been talking about um, artists who uh, mostly are no longer living. So we wanted to make sure that we acknowledge some of the living artists in the exhibition. And so I'm looking at the slide to the left of um, Richard Watson's um, Untitled Landscape with Figures. And I hope that we all um, have no Richard. He's a Philadelphia figure. Um, he, uh, oh, let's see, we're gonna get Sorry. back. I was just making sure okay. I wasn't muted. <laughs> um, thanks, Sarah, for bringing that back up. And Richard, um, something that we can all look forward to is that our, um, our sister institution in town, the African American Museum of Philadelphia, is organizing a retrospective of Richard Watson that will open sometime in the next year, I would imagine. It was scheduled for the fall, so it might be delayed a little bit. Uh, Richard is a PAFA alum. Um, he went to PAFA in the 80s. 
He's an artist who experiments in all sorts of mediums. He is represented in Papa's collection, while some of Dr. Clayton's gift uh, highlight art <coughs> collection. Um, uh, Watson has been in our collection for a number of years. And this landscape with uh, this very moody landscape with a figure or two in it is quite indicative of, of Richard's work where uh, if you know his work at all, he loves to create these moody landscapes that are one of great solitude and have a kind of spiritual quality, at least to my eye. Uh, on the right, an artist who, a 20th century artist who um, was active in Ghana, Mexico, and South Carolina, uh, Tom Feelings, um, is someone may be familiar to all of you for his award, award-winning book, The Middle Passage, uh, made a career as a illustrator of both um, art books and also children's books. And I love to point out, so Tom was someone I knew when I lived in North Carolina in the 90s, and I love to point out that he was the first African-American to win a Caldecott honor um, uh, for one of his children's books. He's new to Papa's collection. We're thrilled to get this currently untitled and undated work, but I think it just needs some research. Uh, the collection is so new to us that um, what's exciting about this gift is there's still more to uncover about it. But I think this is an illustration for his children's book uh, entitled Jumbo Means Hello. And Sarah, let's move on to Lou Sloan since that's a nice segue from Richard Watson. Do you yeah. wanna take it from here? Yeah, um, Lou Sloan is, is another favorite to talk about. Uh, I think he's beloved by Papa and that's very clear here. So we were excited to have such a wide variety of Lou Sloan's included in the gift of this collection. So Sloan is a native Philadelphia artist. He was born and raised here in Philadelphia, grew up in South Philly. He attend, uh, attended PAPA in the 1950s, and he returned to teach and joined the faculty here in 1963. And he remained a teacher at PAPA until his retirement in 1997. Um, Sloan is mostly known for his in plain air paintings, so lots of different landscapes uh, of a great variety. One of the things that I really enjoyed, of course, with bringing in our community is seeing what someone who actually knew Louis Sloan um, ha talk about him. And that would actually be the widow of Barclay Hendricks, Susan Hendricks, who wrote so beautifully about how Louis Sloan was an approachable, warm, and welcoming teacher and mentor, I think, to Barclay Hendricks. One of the things that I've learned so far at my time at PAFA about Lewis Sloan is how he was incredibly supportive not only um, of the institution but to the black artists who were a generation behind him and he was incredibly um, incredibly approachable but also easy for these artists to access. One of the things that I have learned as well is that he would actually invite these young students to come and paint with him uh, at ver a variety of different areas, um, specifically like the Wissahickon, um, but the, the beautiful landscape of Philadelphia. And I think that stands out. Um, and I think it also adds to the generational theme that we really tapped into with Dr. Clayton's collection. And I think, too, it connects to Dr. Clayton's uh, deep involvement with the Philadelphia art scene and supporting those artists in her own community. So let's move to the next slide, Sarah. Um, these are two details of Sloan's. They are beautiful, and I have to say they look gorgeous in our um, lobby of the historic landmark building. And, uh, they connect so richly with so many of the gifts we've already talked about. And let's move to the next slide, Sarah, because I think we're getting to a, a point where we want to open it up to our, our colleagues. And we're going to close with this image. Sarah and I each picked a work that we love from the gift from Dr. Constance E. Clayton. Uh, so we'll end here. And before we open it up to everyone, I'm just going to end with a quote by Elizabeth Catlett, the artist on your left who produced this lithograph entitled Blues Player. And I think it's a quote that operates successfully for both the 
Buford Delaney and the Elizabeth Catlett. So uh, Catlett said in 1973, art for me must develop from a necessity within my people. It must answer a question. It must wake somebody up. It must give a shove in the right direction. The right direction is our liberation, end quote. So Sarah, why don't we take the PowerPoint down and get us back to the Brady Bunch grid where yep. we can see everyone and take, uh, hopefully answer some questions or um, uh, have people share some of the comments that they've been thinking about from this gift. Do I see any, I'm trying to, I'm managing this so I don't see any hands up. Brittany, could I? Could I tease out something that you might want to say about the, the gammon? Sure, sure. Um, I think one of the things that I like thinking about um, for that sculpture is just how that sweet little sculpture of her nephew was so important for her career. Um, there's a way it's, it's deceptive and, you know, it, it has, has this this quiet quality it's this painted plaster um, it's in a couple of institutional collections but when I was writing about it um, for Awakened in You I liked thinking about you know the fact that it's a, a reproduction of a bronze version that won her a fellowship for her to go abroad and so much of how we talk about um, a number of artists who have come through PAFA, either through training or that are in the museum's collection, were often thinking about what it means for artists early in their career, either while they're in art school or right afterward to get to study abroad, like the way the art world really opens up for young artists, um, you know, once they travel outside the country and get to see all sorts of artistic traditions in Europe that they've been reading about, um, or just, you know, the, the way for all of us, I think travel opens up our world, um, particularly if you get to do it as a young person. Um, and so it's a nice kind of, you know, in addition to everything I love about the piece, I also just love what it does in the history of 20th century art. Um, you know, I'm echoing what Sarah says about how important she was. She trained so many artists that, um, became giants of 20th century art. And so to think about her as a teacher, as a sculptor, um, that that piece is her early career piece that really kicks off a career momentum for her is like kind of incredible to, to see in the gallery. Um, it's really, it's, it's a lot more important than, than I think a lot of people would realize just sort of stumbling upon it as, again, this, you know, this sweet little sculpture of her, of her nephew. Right, because it's about, I mean, it could fit on your, your laptop screen. It's so intimate. It's about the size of the Charles White that was one of the works we talked about. I see a hand up. So, Carol, bravo for mastering the technology of Zoom. Um, and we're going to hand it over to you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, good, because I, I was late getting in because I was trying to upload the Zoom. So I have two questions. With, with since the museum is closed, obviously, how long is the exhibit going to be extended, and will we be able to actually come in and see the exhibit before you take it down? Is my first question. Second question is, you know, I really came on because I have some art that I've collected, and I was intrigued by your question of in setting up this um, this. Uh, lecture on what does the process of donating to a private collection in a museum look like? And so, because I'm weighing whether what to do with my personal collection. Well, it's always great. It's always great to have a collector in the house. So welcome, Carol. Um, we, you are such an important part of our ecology um, uh, at PAFA and museums across Philadelphia. So it's nice to have you with us. Um, the show was, uh, will be extended um, uh, in this new time, which is completely surreal, uh, mm -hmm. of not being able to know when we're all, a lot of us, a lot of the staff are on this call with us, and um, we don't know our first day back at work. We're all working remotely. We're all working hard, actually, remotely. Um, <clears throat> we're hoping to be back at PAFA in the summer, let's say July. 
<laughs> we're hoping to reopen PAFA in stages and the museum is part of that reopening as is the art school. Mm -hmm. And um, let's hope that July and August were up and running. And then, Carol, we've extended the show through the new year. Oh, good. So um, the good news is, is that Dr. Clayton's exhibition will be on view 